We took off normally, no problems, everything was fine uh, until we came off tow. I pulled the release, clearing turn to the right as you do, and when we rolled back level, there was this god awful noise. It was loud and it was coming from somewhere close to the cockpit, and I could feel it in the stick, just a big bang. This is Soaring the Sky, a glider pilot's podcast, coming to you from the Mid-Atlantic region here in the United States and bringing you great soaring content from glider pilots all over the globe. We now join Chuck and our guest pilot. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I think you're going to love hearing from our brand new guest pilot, Steve Kelty. Now, Steve's father was an engineer, so he has been around aviation since he was very young, hanging out at the airport, watching test flights and soaking up all the sights and sounds he could, even having the opportunity as a kid to be around aviation royalty Bob Hoover. He also had the opportunity to be around other famous aviators. Now, Steve sits down with our producer, Mitch, and shares some stories about catching thermals above pineapple fields in Hawaii and other experiences he has had in the cockpit. Now, one of those flights he shares with us actually affected him so much that he walked away from the sport for a while. Steve also flies a very unique glider. You are not going to want to miss hearing about this. He's going to share the story behind that. And after Mitch's chat with Steve, we are going to join Sergio the Soaring Master for another new segment. And this one is about sailplane improvements. All that right now on episode 121 on Soaring the Sky. Wings and Wheels has been serving the soaring and sport aviation community for over 30 years. They hands down have the largest and most comprehensive inventory of sailplane and soaring supplies in North America. And they ship globally. Nearly everything you'll find on their site is in stock and ready for same-day shipping. Wings and Wheels is the exclusive American representative for HPH sailplanes. Be sure to check out the Twin Shark, their latest launch. They're also now the exclusive distributor in North America for the new Just Soaring Glider Sim Pro. The team has thousands of hours of flying experience in gliders and airplanes. Staffed by Adam, Kelly, Julie, and Sean, a friendly voice will answer when you call or email them. Check them out at wingsandwheels.com. Steve Kelty, welcome to Soaring the Sky podcast. Hey, thanks, Mitch. Thanks uh, so much for having me on. I I really enjoy your podcast, so I appreciate the invite. Right on. Yeah, we, we really enjoy uh, doing it and sharing stories with the community. So we'll just kind of jump right in and, you know, the drill, you know, we usually start out with the guest pilot kind of doing a, um, you know, like a self bio sort of an intro, you know, how you got into aviation, how you got into um, soaring, all that good stuff. So I'll just kind of let you run with that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up in Northern Nevada in Reno for the most part, anyway. My father was an engineer and he worked for Lear Avia on the Lear Fan 2100 project in the 80s. Um, occasionally, I was out at the Stead Airport. Um, occasionally, he'd take me out to, to, to Stead with him and I was able to, you know, look around and, and watch everyone working on and, and, and building this amazing new plane. Uh, the Lear Fan looked a lot like the Lear Jet, but it was a turbo push prop with a y-shaped empennage um so you know in my young opinion it was the coolest looking modern aircraft that i had ever seen you know they were they were building and testing right there in front of me it was it was really a a super cool experience for i must have been i don't know 11 or 12 at the time the people there were amazing the chief pilot at the time was a guy named don madonna uh if i remember correctly he was a former f4 phantom driver um, and he was just very, he was always really super nice to me. I remember he'd show me the the video that the chase plane had taken from the last test flight. And he'd say, you know, watch this, Steve. And I did this next maneuver just for you. And, yeah. The plane would I mean, bank. Just, I mean, huh? just his name is cool. You know? Um, oh yeah. 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 Colonel, yeah, Colonel Don Madonna. So, you know, he'd, see, he'd be like, watch this, Steve, this is, we did this for you. And the plane would bank dramatically or something. I'd be just all blown away. I'd be like, wow, you guys did that just for me. You know, I had no clue. I just ate it up. And of course, we had the, yeah, it, was, it was amazing. Uh, we had the Reno Air Races right there, you know, at Stead as well. Um, my dad and I went every year and I'd hang out at the Lear Hangar, which was wow. it's now, where they, yeah, it's now where they park the sport class planes. 
that was where my dad's office was. Um, so we'd sit there in lawn chairs with an av radio and it was just, it was the best time. So you're, you're kind of an airport rat from relatively early days. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. My, um, my dad introduced me to, to so many amazing people. I had no idea at the time, but you know, I already mentioned Don Madonna, but the other pilot flying for Lear at the time was, uh, John Penny of rare bear, uh, air race fame. Uh, there was Gordon Cooper from the Mercury seven project, uh, Greg Boynton, Art Scholl. Um, and then of course the guy who without a doubt had the greatest impact on me. Um, and that was Bob Hoover. Bob was just the nicest, most gracious guy every year I'd see him and he'd, he'd call me by my first name and he'd remember me. He was, he was probably exactly the same way with all the kids, but you know, all I knew was that Bob was somewhat of a big deal <laughs> and he was paying attention to me. And of course I had at the time, no clue how big of a deal he was, you know, and, and all of these people, they were just aviation royalty. Right. So, and here's this, this little kid hanging around. And, you know, honestly, this was kind of during a, a, a rough time, you know, I mean, like a lot of kids, my parents were split up. Uh, I didn't really get to see my dad all that much. My mom had some you know, pretty severe emotional issues. So, that wasn't fun. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, contrast that with being able to go out to Lear and the air races and, and hang out with this crowd and, and have those, you know, very accomplished, impressive adults take the time to be nice to you and everything. And it was a big deal yeah. to a little kid, yeah. you know, during a really crappy time. A positive escape from all the other crap going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then my high school, or, uh, Wooster High School in Reno, had this super cool science class. Uh, it was aviation, aeronautical, space science, taught by a teacher named Larry Rakoviak, um, who was another guy that had a huge impact on me. And I, I promise that class was the only A grade I think I ever got in high school. <laughs> you know, uh, it was really, really neat. So, I mean, the thing was, how can you be surrounded by all of that and not, you know, be bitten by the aviation bug, you know? And then, you know, eventually, I saw Top Gun and that was it. I went off to the Navy where I'd spend the next 10 years as a operations specialist and air intercept controller, which was a very cool job. Um, toward the end of my enlistment, I was stationed at Barber's Point Naval Air Station on Oahu. Uh, and while I was there, I, I mentioned to one of the P3 Orion pilots that I knew that I wanted to go get my pilot's mm -hmm. license. Uh, and he suggested, he said, well, go try gliders out first. It'll make you a, make you a better pilot. Um, and he was absolutely right. By the uh, way, there was a commercial. Yeah, glider. yeah I was going to say, let me there let me guess. Commercial. You're going to you're going to end up at uh, what is it called? Dill Dillingham or something? Yeah, Dillingham. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, Dillingham was up there in the northwest yeah. side of Oahu, um, and that's where I started. Uh, the place was owned by Elmer Udd, who's pretty well known in the soaring community. Um, I just I absolutely loved it. It felt so different and more peaceful than powered planes. I was full on addicted. I had a really good instructor named Mary Campbell and I flew with her almost every day. Uh, and it was just, it was great. It's an amazing experience. That's a really cool um, field. And are, are they still, do you know if they're still operating commercially? I know that, I know that the state or the government or something wanted to, I don't know, they wanted to terminate the lease or whatever. Do, do you know what the status of the field yeah. is right now? Yeah, I know it is currently, uh, ha it currently has kind of a stay of execution. You know, I don't know all the details, but what you were saying sounded right. I think, you know, they just didn't want to keep it up any longer. And uh, there's some drama regarding the lease in the, in the Department of the Army or something yeah. like that, if I remember correctly. Um, but they, uh, they were able to, to keep it open. Now, I, I, I think the, the glider operations that are running there uh, may have changed hands. I don't, I don't know who's still there. Um, I know, uh, Elmer, uh, Elmer Ud passed away yeah. some time ago, but. But what a cool place to, to start to soar because I mean, from what I understand about the place, you can, you know, you can, you can either winch launch or tow out and then they have a ridge that works and then they have, you know, you can, you can get, you know, thermals, you can do all kind of, all kind of stuff. And it's very adjacent to the airport. Um, just, you know, just release it whatever 1500 and away you go. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Didn't have an opportunity to do a lot of, a lot of cross country flying there. I'm sure others did. I just, I, you know, I, I couldn't, but we had thermals off the pineapple fields and were, were really good. The Ridge lift was good. It was, it was great. It's a beautiful place to fly. Right on. 
And so that's the, that's kind of the genesis of your, of your soaring career. And, and you were what in your late mid, mid late twenties or something when this was happening. Yep. Yep. Mid twenties. And then where did it, where did it kind of go from there? Did you have like a big hiatus, like a lot of people do when you're growing a family and all that kind of stuff, or did you stick with it or what, what was the, what, what was the roadmap from there? Yeah. So, um, I got out of the military and, uh, moved back to the States. I moved back to Reno where I was from and just stopped flying, uh, which is crazy, right? Because I've got Minden, uh, the, the, the Mecca of soaring in North America. I've got it right there in my backyard, but I just got so busy with, you know, life and family and, and career that, um, I, I didn't fly for years. It wasn't until I started working down in Las Vegas that I, um, I got linked up with the, uh, with the Las Vegas Valley Soaring Association. And, um, so what, this is what a couple, couple, three years ago, I guess. Yeah, it was actually a, about a year ago, just one year ago, you know, I, okay. I, I had taken a friend of mine out there to show him some airplanes because he was, he was just asking questions. He had never flown and, and we happened to be out in the area. So I just drove him by the airport and uh, kind of explained how soaring worked and, you know, talked about, you know, how dumb it was that I had gone years without doing it. So, you know, later that week, I, I looked up the local glider club. I got their email off the website. Uh, the president of the club, Steve Payne, called me back like an hour later. Um, and here we are. And, you know, I've, they're just an amazing group of people out there. They've got a, I think they've built a, a very supportive and collaborative club. Mm -hmm. One of the main things I like about uh, LVVSA, and, and I'm sure it's, it's probably common with a lot of clubs, is that everybody is very open and transparent. You know, we've got a lot of very accomplished pilots, but there's no ego struggle out there. You know, everyone openly trades ideas on what's going well and what's not going well. They're not afraid mm -hmm. to speak up, you know, about something that they saw mm -hmm. or they you know, they thought might be unsafe or something like that. And I think then the result is that the club ends up with a really safe learning environment kind of culture. You know, it's it's really impressive. I'm, I'm just I'm bummed I let so many years go by without finding them first. Yeah, well, that's a common refrain from a, a lot of people that that take a kind of a big hiatus. Sort of like, you know, could could I have squeezed it into my life matrix? But you know that's it's water under the bridge. So you go back. You're you're trying to get currency again. You're probably flying, you know, with an instructor for a little bit. And then at some point, you probably get you probably get this notion that you know, gee, I should I should probably get myself, you know, a glider to fly. That's exactly kind of how it went down. You know, I had been looking for something that was fun but affordable. Um, I was looking at like. Schweitzer 135s or standard Cirrus, standard LaBelle, something like that. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I knew I wanted a single place sailplane. I knew I wanted something with flaps. Uh, I had never flown a flap ship before, so I thought that would be an interesting thing to learn. Um, mm -hmm. I've never really been into super techie modern aircraft. You know, even when I was growing up, my favorite airplanes were always vintage. You know, I thought jet fighters were cool, but I'll take a Corsair or a Piper Cub any day. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't tell me that a stagger wing beach craft isn't the most beautiful aircraft you've ever seen. Right. Uh, and I feel the same about gliders. So I wanted a little, I wanted something a little uh, old school, the 233s, mm -hmm. you know, I, I love the 233s, not because they're high performance, obviously, but because we all learned in them, you know, that's the aircraft that made yep. you a pilot. There's, there's something nostalgic about that. Yeah. The 126, you know, another cool one. So that was, that was kind of the, the, the type of thing I was looking for. And so it ends up being a pretty, a pretty rare and cool glider type. And, and we'll, we'll circle back to that a little bit later yeah. in the interview. We'll just kind of rip through a few, a few questions that we, we usually ask um, guest pilots and then we'll, we'll get into that glider, which is, which is super cool. Um, spent like an hour kind of, researching and looking through that and some of the notes and links that you sent, I think the community is going to be pretty interested. Yeah. It's, it's really neat. I'm really excited about it. Um, okay. So cool. Here we go. So for you, what's the most memorable flight you've had in a glider and what made it special? And it can be kind of good, bad, fun, scary, none, or all of the above, just sort of whatever kind of <laughs> comes top of your list. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
I think the, the first one that comes to mind was a bit on the scary side. It actually had me walk away from the sport for a while. This was before, this is when I, when I moved, after I moved from Reno, but before I had linked up with the guys at the, uh, at the glider club out at Gene, um, I had been doing some flying with a local commercial operation and I was up one day in an ASK 21 with an instructor and we took off normally, no problems. Everything was fine. Uh, until we came off tow, I pulled the release clearing turn to the right as you do. And when we rolled back level, there was this God awful noise. It was loud and it was coming from somewhere close to the cockpit and I could feel it in the stick, just a big bang oh, that, that vibrated good. up. To the control. <laughs> shit, yeah, no, shit. my first, yeah, not good. my first thought was that it was a control cable, you know, that a controlled cable had snapped. And so as pilots tend to do, right, we immediately tried to recreate the problem mm -hmm. and there it was again, another big bang. So now it just so happened at that moment that we were basically on the same heading we had been on takeoff, right? So we're pointed into the wind mm -hmm. and just ahead of us out in the distance is a very large dry lake bed. The plane seemed to be flying fine, straight and level, but when we you know, we still thought this was a control cable issue or maybe a control surface failure or something like that. So I was not really excited about making any more big turns. So, you know, my first thought was, well, let's just fly straight ahead mm -hmm. and put it down on the lake bed. Mm -hmm. No pattern, no mm -hmm. turns, just straight ahead if at all possible. And, mm -hmm. and really, I have no doubt that had I been alone, that's exactly what I would have done. And mm -hmm. I still wonder if maybe it wouldn't have been a good idea. So as I suggested that to the instructor, he says, and uh, I remember kind of laughing out loud at his comment. He says, well, we still seem to be flying, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and he suggested that we make a, he, he, yeah. Then we, he suggested we make a shallow left turn, line up on the runway and, and put it back on the ground, which is what we did. And the landing went fine. We got out of the glider, took a look around. Uh, and one of us, uh, I don't recall which one mm -hmm. uh, anymore, but one mm -hmm. of us pulled the seat up. Mm -hmm. uh, the seat that I had been sitting in the forward, forward pilot seat. Mm -hmm. And there was the problem. Now, unbeknownst to me or the instructor, the owner of the commercial shop, I guess earlier that day had installed a fairing around the main gear. Uh, and I guess there was a, you know, a shortage of proper screws to use that day or something. So he just used a rather long wood screw. Really? I, I kid you not. You, I can't make this up. And the screw was so long that the control cable was getting hung up on it. So apparently in steeper turns, the cable would go over the screw without hitting it. But then when you'd roll level, it wow. would snag on the screw and then pop over it, and which made that big, loud snapping sound. Yeah, I mean, it's, so, it's quiet in a glider cockpit. So even something as, <laughs> as small as that is a, is a big is a big sound and yeah and a lot of commercial operations you know these days and especially the ones that that operate on like rougher fields they actually they actually just pull those fairings off because they get they just get so you know dinged up with mm -hmm. with rocks and stuff like that mm -hmm. but uh yeah but, that would make sense but yeah that that had to have been pretty uh you know, attention getting i guess in the moment yeah it did there's actually a there's an entry in my logbook that day that um, in pretty colorful language, I vowed to never go back to that FBO. <laughs> you know, honestly, that, yeah, yeah, that hadn't been the only issue, you know, um, yeah. I was already yeah. pretty uneasy with the situation. I mean, and those, and those ships I, are just, are just so bulletproof. They're super, super tough. I mean, in terms of training gliders, you know, fiber oh, yeah. training gliders, those, those things have, they've just been through a lot and they're, they're really tough, but yeah. that's a, yeah, that's a good, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good one. I yeah. you know, probably freak yeah, out it, and, it, and, you know, it's a fewer, if you were solo, your, your thought process there, I mean, if you didn't have somebody in the back seat, your thought process is probably right, which is, yeah, just, you know, let's just keep it straight and level and pull some air brake and, and just get down mm -hmm. safely on the ground. Well, cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's uh, you know, that's kind of interesting. So far in your in your kind of soaring, you know, history, what what kind of conditions um, do you enjoy flying in? I mean, there's obviously in the West Coast, there's a whole lot of a lot of stuff out there. Conversions, you know, just kind of straight up thermal days. I know you guys have some kind of local 
ridge there. It's not real long, but you, you do have some ridge. Of course, you got wave and all that. What kind of floats your boat? Yeah, so I haven't started cross country uh, flying yet. So there's a lot of different conditions that I haven't really been exposed to yet. But of course, we have thermals out there all the time. Some of them are pretty dynamic. Um, we've got ridge lift right there, um, right near the airport. Mm-hmm. That uh, when on some of the windier days, that can uh, you know you can do pretty well with that. I haven't flown in wave out here yet, and I haven't tried convergence at all. So that's you know one of the things i love about flying so i'll never run out of new things to learn and uh those are kind of on my list cool yeah and you guys are kind of in a spot where yeah you don't get a bunch of convergence and then when you do get wave you might get blown out on the ground as well so that kind of that kind of makes sense yeah There, there are a lot of cool areas not far from us too you know that you can get out and see you know different different operations with different conditions it's a it's a good location there's nothing that's too far from us you know or i should say that there's a lot of a lot of good spots that are pretty close to us so in your soaring journey so far and in the process of learning how to be a a better soaring pilot what was the hardest thing or things for you to feel like you had some basic competence or mastery in along the way i guess it's a little different for everybody kind of depending on your your goals and path but how about you yeah yeah there's definitely been challenges <laughs> um you know because i took so much time off you know and when i finally linked up with las vegas belly soaring uh, association i went out there i got paired up with scott graham who's an absolutely excellent pilot and a very patient instructor but honestly it didn't really go all that well at first um some of the things that had come really easily to me when i was younger were really giving me trouble the skills just were not coming back quickly managing glide slope for example that had been one of my favorite parts of flying you know just nailing the landings but i was just absolutely having a terrible time with it mm-hmm. but Scott stuck with me, you know, mm-hmm. gave me some really good advice. Um, and that was, you know, if you've, if you spent a long time away from flying, your brain is going to remember how it used to be, you know, back when you had all this positive muscle memory, back when everything was flowing well, but that's not there any longer. Right. And you need to rebuild it and it's going to be frustrating. And that, what he said made a lot of sense to me. And at least it was, <laughs> at least it was better than just, you know, thinking mm-hmm. that I was a, a crap pilot. So, um, that's what I focused on. And we just stuck at it. You know, we had, a, we had some long days. Yeah. Uh, we flew one weekend and did 11 sorties in one day. And Scott said that that was a new record for him. And then we went out the next weekend and flew 18 <laughs> in one day. So uh, long days. And if I, by the way, if I remember correctly, we flew both of those days with the same tow pilot. So Matt, if you're listening, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for being here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Matt, re- but, Matt, Matt remembers you. I bet. Yeah, I bet. That's yeah, a long time sitting in the Pawnee, you know, all day long. Yeah. But it's then one day it just started working, you know? So that was the big hurdle for me, just powering through it, you know, yeah. until start things started making sense again. So what kind of soaring flights do you kind of have it, sort of as your, as your goals go forward, you know, how do you see your kind of soaring evolving and, and what kind of, what kind of flights do you, you know, do you want to do? Is it, cross country stuff, you know, racing, just kind of just kind of hang around home and do recreational you know, shorter flights and what's your kind of roadmap? Yeah, yeah. So, right now I've got to focus on really learning the nuances um of the LP15. Uh like I said earlier, I've never flown a flap ship before this, so there's a learning curve, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, especially with this plane's history, I feel like like I'm more like it's custodian, you know, than an owner. Like th- mm-hmm. there's this responsibility that you have to take care of it. So I really want to fly it well. I want to keep it in good shape um, so that it's available for my kids. Um, our son is a, is a helicopter pilot for the army. So, you know, who knows, maybe someday he'll, he'll give it a go. Right on. I haven't done any. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I haven't done any cross country flying, so that's the next big step for me. Luckily, there are a lot of our club members with a ton of experience. So um, I'll have the benefit of, of tap being able to tap into that. Yeah, I mean, um, you can do some follow flies and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, go go out with somebody that that kind of you know drags you around with them, pushes your comfort level a little bit. Um, but as long as you got somebody that kind of knows what they're doing and they know what your you know your limitations are and and all that, and you've got you know, you've got land outs. Mm-hmm. 
that are available, that's always a good way to kind of tiptoe into it, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, it, I really look forward to all of that too, you know, just the, the constant learning and growing as a pilot. That really excites me. Our, long, our, our youngest daughter uh, just started college. She's going into her sophomore year. And, and over this last year, while well, she's been away at college, it's, it's you know, it kind of makes you a little jealous. You know, it makes you think that, wow, I, w- I wish I could go back to school. I, I wish I could take some time to learn this or learn that or perfect something. And well, you know, here's my chance. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to all that. Yeah. Well, soaring is the infinite learning curve. You're never <laughs> really done. I mean, it's, it's just, right, right. you know, it's, it, there's just, there's just so much out there. Yeah. And you get reminded of that every time too. You know? So do you, do you get any inspiration from watching, you know, other, other glider um, sailplane guys on, on YouTube at all? I, you know, I do. I, I, um, all kinds of aviation stuff, right? Not just soaring, but mm-hmm. when I, when I started getting into this, I, you know, I'd been outside of the community for so long, I kind of needed to catch up. And I, I looked into, especially the educational content that they have out there on social media. And there's a lot of really good stuff. Um, I've seen a, a lot of Bruno Vassal stuff, for example, he's, he's got just really great content and beautiful scenery, by the way, you know, he's not overly techie, just that amazing scenery. And he's having a blast. Um, I've got a flat screen TV in my office and sometimes I, I actually play his videos on it, you know, and people stop by and check it out and ask about, soaring and you know who knows maybe that plants the seed for somebody stefan langer has got some amazing amazing stuff up obviously speaking of him he's coming out to the he's coming out to the u.s i think in um in september so he'll be he'll be uh tearing it up on the on the west coast and uh posting some some cool videos that's going to be that's going to be a whole bunch of fun coming out here to break all our records (laughs) that'll be great Oh, yeah, yeah uh, he's actually he's he's yeah he's doing pretty well in in uh in his uh I think he's in a German contest right now, but uh, but yeah, YouTube's got a, a bunch of great stuff. Um, if you haven't checked it out, Chess in the Air, mm-hmm. Clemens Chipek, he's probably got the you, you were saying techie in terms of just technical detail and real kind of play by play blow by blow of what's happening with the weather, you know, the air, the lift, all that kind of stuff. His, his stuff is, is just super, super good. He's kind of newer to the scene, but um, he's, he's doing some really, really excellent content, probably worth you know, checking it out. Yeah. I'll, I'll look it up. I haven't seen that one yet. Um, yeah. There's a couple of others that I really like, I like um, uh, Jason at the soaring channel. He's got some really good stuff. Um, and how great is this? I mean, he saw a social media post of mine from not long ago where I mentioned having some pedostatic problems. And he reaches out to me, sent me a video to look at. That was a huge help. Um, and since then, he's he's offered a, a ton of advice on flight computers, um, more follow-up, troubleshooting the the air system. It's, it's really been a lot of help, uh, you know, to a total stranger. He doesn't know me from Adam. And yeah. it's just, it's been great. It's one of the things I really love about the aviation community. And there's a, there's one other that I think of, it's not soaring specific, but I have to mention it anyway, because I I think it's directly relatable. And that's the content that Elliot Segan had uh, at Wasabi Flight Test out of Mojave has up. Yeah. Elliot puts out, I don't know. Yeah. Have you seen it? He he puts some amazing stuff up about, you know, the projects he's working on. And and even though it is pretty tech heavy, he also keeps it interesting and super informative. And I think it's an excellent reminder about going about things in a careful, measured way, you know, expecting the unexpected, managing the problem, having a plan. I mean, that, that spans all types mm-hmm. of aviation, you know, and it's directly relatable and things that we should all kind of keep at the front of our minds. Because even if you think, well, I don't need that stuff. I'm not a test pilot. I'm just recreational. Well, you know, if, if you're flying something new or you're doing something that you haven't done before, then you know, guess what? <laughs> That's a test flight and you had better, yeah. you had better be thinking it the right way. Right. So anyway, if you, no. if you, if you've seen this stuff, great. If your listeners haven't, they probably should check it out. Do, you know, do, do yourself a favor and check it out. That's a super good point. And it's a good segue for, for our next question about safety because um, aviation safety. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is kind of, it, it, it's very universal. You're in a glider, you're in a, 
you know, you're in a military aircraft or an aerobatic aircraft, you know, whatever it is. So I know you had the story about the, uh, you know, the control lines kind of binding up with a screw and stuff, but maybe there's another situation or event or near situation um, in your kind of soaring history so far that, that gave you a kind of a wake up call, uh, you know, something related to safety. Yeah. Do, do you yeah, have any, definitely. do you have any kind of vignette there you could kind of share with us or, you know, what, you know, somebody else in the community could benefit from relative to soaring safety? Yeah, a, a, a couple come to mind, actually, you know, as I was saying, I'm just learning how to fly the LP 15 and, uh, and deal with the flaps. And uh, yeah, I was really anxious about managing my landings. Uh, well, so, you know, I was focused on glide slope and airspeed and all that. And I, I went up, had a flight, came in on uh, on approach, every the pattern and, and, and everything looked fine, got on final, lined up perfectly well, touched down just fine, but then lifted off again unexpectedly, you know, kind of went flying again there for a little while. It wasn't a bounce. It literally just took off again. And then it, mm-hmm. I was slow at this point, right? So I, then I, I started getting you know, sideways and really uncomfortable in the crosswind, you know, 15 Mm -hmm. feet off the runway, slow, and it starts wobbling, Dutch roll kind of thing. Not, not good. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So luckily I I had a camera uh, going in the cockpit. So I was able to kind of look at it later and find out, you know, see if, see if I could find out um, what I was doing. And um, what I saw was, you know, I've been flying the 233 and the 126 a lot recently, you know, and their spoiler handle is right in the same spot as the flap handle on the, AP, uh, on the LP-15. And I noticed that without even realizing it, as soon as I touched the runway, my left hand on that flap handle started coming back. Now, in a 126 or a 233, that's because you're starting to pull the, the, the spoiler handle back so you can start, you know, edging into the brakes. But that's not where the brakes are at on an LP 15. So I actually was dialing in just slightly more flap. That's why it lifted off. I've totally done that in my glider when I was, when I was first. uh, Yeah. So if anything with flaps, once your main kind of touches down, you know, you, you dump them forward, um, you know, kind of negative so that you're not getting lift um, when you don't want lift. And then, you know, but, but it's a, it's a, uh, you know, there's, there's some sort of gymnastics there with your hands and, and if you're not used to it, it's one of the reasons that, that we did the, uh, you know, the just soaring, you know, simulator cockpit as well, so that people can kind of play around with, yeah. you know, the, the, those different configurations and, and just stuff that you're, you know, cause if you haven't been checked out in a, you know, like a quarter million dollar what you know like a asg 32 or like a flapped ship or something you're kind of on your own and I, I could totally see that happening and and i've i've done exactly the same thing you just create a bunch of lift under the wing when you don't really want it and then you puff you puff up and now you're slow you know you might have a mm-hmm. little bit of a quarter and crosswind and yep, now you're just trying exactly to not you're, you're not trying to dump it on the ground or pio you, you, you know and and yeah, that's 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 definitely a thing. And yeah, and, yeah. and that's just that's so, just one of the one of the reasons that we we were trying to you know introduce a kind of a simulator cockpit to the community too, where you could actually you know just simulate that on the ground, where um, you just get that muscle memory burned in, where you know it's like okay, my main's down, you kind of neutralize your flaps, get back in the air brake. Um, cause yeah, reps are kind of anything, whether you're, you know, whatever you're doing. Yeah. I thought about exactly that. That was one of the first things I thought about when I got back on the ground that, you know, if I had had some time in, uh, in a simulator, uh, I could have solved that problem. And then, you know, and then frankly, just in the interest of pure transparency, I, I also compounded the problem because, um, I could also tell on that video when I played it that I was not working my rudders very well. So I was not managing. I think I was just so focused on managing the glide slope and not hitting hard and not bouncing and all that, that I, yeah. I didn't, you know, I wasn't properly aviating. So I, and I wasn't managing that crosswind. So yeah. anyway, it, it worked fine. Uh, you know, I, I just edged forward a little bit with the flaps and it went right back down on the runway, came to a stop, no problem. So yeah. just a learning curve. 
All right. So one last question before we jump into your your LP15, which is uh, yeah, super cool glider. If there's one glider port in the world, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or outside the U.S., and you know, cost budget aside, um, and you could spend a few days flying out, like you know, what's on your bucket list in in terms of just you know wh- where you'd want to go, spend a few days soaring? Hmm. Um, I think. You know, I haven't, I've never been over in Europe and I think it's beautiful and they've got awesome soaring conditions and everything. But so that would be the easy answer. But honestly, I think there's a gliding club called QNIM uh, Gliding Club just outside of Banff, Canada. And I think I would go there. Just My wife and I once took a trip to Banff and absolutely fell in love with it. I mean, the, the Canadian Rockies are just phenomenal. They're magnificent. So a trip up there, you know, I could get into some good flying and score some husband points at the same time. So I think I'd have to go with that. <laughs> okay. So cool. So here, here we are with the, uh, and I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. It's a, it's a Leister LP 15. Yeah. Maybe we could chat a little bit about the designers and some of their history. And I guess it was a father and son team, uh-huh. pretty colorful characters um, doing really amazing and groundbreaking glider design work, you know, most of their lives. You know, there's a lot of good American aviation stories from, from that period. You know, I, I don't think these guys were sort of any exception to that. So yeah, maybe you could just kind of introduce people to the, uh, to the designers and, and, and the glider a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I didn't know anything about Jack and Bill Leister until, I started looking into buying the LP 15, but the, yeah, you're right. They've got, they've got a hell of a history. Um, so there's Jack Laster and then there's his son, Bill. Now Jack who passed away in 2006, I think he's in the national soaring museum hall of fame, just a, an absolute true pioneer. He designed and built uh, the Yankee doodle, which was America's entry to the aerobatic competition in the 1939 Paris air show. He designed the CG-10 Trojan horse, which is a huge, I think, gross weight, I think is 25,000 pounds, a huge cargo glider that was built specifically to support the invasion of Japan uh, that obviously never ended up happening. Um, And then Jack, together with his son, Bill, went on to develop several aircraft, many of which I'm I'm sure I'm not even aware of, you know, some of them included like the, the LP 46, the LP 49 that uh, some of your listeners may have heard of. And then in the early seventies, the LP 15 nugget, which is what I now have. Um, Thankfully Bill is still with us. um, And I've had the benefit of talking with him. He's, it's just really amazing to be able to talk to the person who designed your airplane, you know, he knows bits and pieces about that that I certainly don't know. And they're not in any book somewhere. This, this aircraft is experimental. It never went into production. Um, so I don't have the benefit of, of a lot of manuals. And, you know, he built this thing 50 years ago. And literally just yesterday, he's on the phone with me helping me find parts for my wheel and brake assembly. I mean, <laughs> that's, how's that for customer service, right? I mean, that's just incredible. But it's it really is an honor to fly his airplane. Uh, I feel a responsibility that I need to earn it, and it, it makes it be you know all the much all the all the more better to be able to talk to him about it. Um, and then this was a huge surprise to me that I learned just recently. I had mentioned earlier that my father's time on the Learfan project was got me interested. It was what got me interested in aviation, and mm-hmm. uh, and I really can't stress enough how important that was, you know, and, and for my dad too, um, without a doubt, that was the thing in his professional career that he was the most proud of. Well, turns out that Bill, Bill Laster and I are talking the other day and, and I mentioned to him that I had grown up in Reno and where my dad had worked. And, and it turns out that Bill had worked for Lear as well. Um, at the same time my dad did. So he starts rattling off all these names that I hadn't heard from years, all this, the, all the same people. It was just really, really amazing. I I told him, Bill, I'm sitting at my desk and on my desk, there's a model of the Lear fan right in front of me, you know? (laughs) So it's just an amazing, really, really cool, small world. Well, so before we jump into kind of a few of the technicals on, on your glider, which are really cool and yeah, just super cutting edge for the, for the time. 
one thing I was pretty surprised just there about a couple of minutes ago is like, I have no idea that, uh, that we ever had plans to fly military cargo gliders into an invasion of Japan. So that's, uh, that's a new data point uh, for me. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. There, there's a lot of good information out there That's about um, about the lasers. You, yeah, spend some time on Google. It's pretty it's pretty neat, pretty foreign. So take us through the LP15 a little bit. So it's what it's 19. It was built in 1971, 72, something like that. They started building them at about that time. Uh, mine took its. I've got airframe number seven. And it uh, it took its first flight in October of 1975, October 10th, if I remember correctly. Jack Leister actually wrote him, you know, the logbook entry uh, himself for that. You know, I had been looking around for um, uh, for that type of glider, you know, although I, I had no mm-hmm. idea, you know, what the what the LP15 was all about. But I'd been looking around for something in that in that category. Um, and then, you know, one day, one of the instructors at our club tells me about the LP 15 and that the club, the club had one on the line and they actually had one in a trailer that was just sitting there and it needed some work, but it was, it was still in good shape. And, you know, if I was willing to do the work, maybe the club would sell it to me. And so I looked into it and, you know, it, it looked to me to be exactly the kind of thing I was looking for. It was one of only 15 ever built. You know, there's only nine remaining, one of which is in the National Soaring Museum. I, it was just perfect. You know, it hit all the right nostalgic vintage buttons for me. And the kicker was that the last annual had been done by a club member who I really respect and, and trust. So that gave me the comfort level I needed. It was kind of a no brainer. So, but like te- te- technically, I said it's, I a, was, it's a pretty I mean, sophisticated glider for its time, right? So it, it had. It's it's got like yeah. retractable gear. It's got it's got flaps. It was also sort of a hybrid thing. It's got you know aluminum fiberglass. Yeah, it's got a yeah, it's got a composite nose. Um, so from the nose to about the uh, the to the pilot's compartment, it's um, uh, fiberglass, and then the rest of it is aluminum. Um, it's like you said, it's flaps. It's got, um, it's 15 meter standard class. Uh, it had water ballast that was located just behind the pilot right on the seat. Oh yeah. So that was, the, that was the an ballast. I feature. forgot about that. Yep. Um, yeah. And advertised with a, you know, when it was new with a glide ratio of just over 36 to one. So yeah, it was, it, it looked really attractive to me. I let the club know that I was interested in it. They had to put it to a vote in the next members meeting. Coincidentally, that meeting happened to fall on a day when I was out at the Reno Air Races, um, so with my family. So I, th- I thought that was pretty apropos, you know. <laughs> right. um, I called. I called into the meeting. I found a quiet spot, you know, where I could sort of hear what was going on, and, which wasn't easy. Now you got to remember that this ship had been owned by a former club member, who happened to be a real badass fighter pilot um, named Chad Dvorak. Um, and he had been friends with all of these guys, all these folks in the club. Yeah. And I'm now, you know, yeah. I'm now asking if I can buy Shad's glider, yeah. you know, so I was nervous about it. You know, would they yeah. trust me? Was I, was I too? Were, were you going to be a worthy kind of steward of, 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 of the glider, yeah. right? I mean. Which I think was, yeah, which would have been fair for them to think of, you know, this is their friendship. Yeah. Um, but they approved it. And um, and it was a big deal. It, I don't mind saying. So, it was so a how many big how many of these are they, operational they, they, and flying in the the world of soaring now? So um, as I said, I, there were fifteen that were made, including the prototype. One of them is in the soaring museum. I, I believe there are only nine remaining, including the one in the soaring museum. So it's a pretty small group. Okay. Now, I don't know, you know, I've just, that's the information I found on the FAA's website, but that's what I was able to find. So what are, what's your sort of favorite thing about the glider? And it doesn't matter what glider you have. I mean, everybody's got their kind of least favorite thing about their glider. It doesn't matter what, you know, what you fly, but like sort of what, what's your, yeah. So what's your kind of thing. dichotomy there. Basically just it's overall performance. You know, I, I don't really have enough time in it yet to really speak to all the nuances, but it just flies so well. And so much better than I had expected. I, I really feel fortunate 
to be able to fly it. I, you know, I've told people, I'm very clear, it, it flies much better than I do. So that's, that's I think, my favorite thing. Um, as far as the least favorite thing, it really needs a paint job. <laughs> it's got some scratches. It's got some pretty good dings in the paint that I need to fill. Paint's pretty oxidized. So I actually, you know, I hope to hit it with a buffer and some compound this weekend. And I think we can get it to, you know, bring the, bring the paint back to life a little bit, but sooner or later, it's well, going to need a new. Well, I mean, what kind of finish is it though? Is it, is it, it's, it's not gel coat. It's some kind of bonded. Um, Cause I mean, like the wings are aluminum. So like, what is the finish? Is it a, is it like a poly urethane? Yeah, paint, I, mean, or I really can't is, say. Is it gel coat? I, I don't know. It's definitely not gel coat. It's, uh, I don't think it's anything, you know, special on it. I don't, you know, I'm not saying it's like house paint or anything like that, but I just don't have any info on what it might be. It's got kind of an eggshell, uh, texture to it. Um, so I don't know what, yeah. and, and it looks like it's been painted several different times mm -hmm. and they don't, you know, so it doesn't really all match, but, but I like mm -hmm. it. I had originally thought that I was going to paint it and completely redo the paint job. And now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of rethinking that it's got this red, white, and blue paint scheme. That's pretty cool. And oh, it's super yeah, cool. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the glider when I was out there. I mean, yes, yeah, so I think it's, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's very American. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, I think, it's it might, super, it's super. I think I might keep it like that just kind of a, as a, as a nod to, to the previous owners. Yeah. That's, that's a good, yeah, but it's definitely, so it, it, it needs to be, keep it, keep it, keep it true, keep it true to its colors. Right. right? But it, it definitely needs a little bit of a facelift. So I might, I might be looking for a aircraft, you know, paint job sponsor at some point. A little teal yeah. goes a long way. So cool. So we're sort of on our short final here with the, with the interview mm -hmm. and what we always like to do at the end is, uh, you know, give our guest pilots a chance to give shout outs to, you know, people that have been influential or supportive in their uh, aviation and, and soaring lives, um, mentors, instructors, soaring buddies, family, you know, sort of you name it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I already acknowledged the the really cool folks from when I was young, but as far as a shout out, I, I, it would have to be all the folks at the LVVSA at the, at the glider club here. They've been kind enough to help me out and, and, and make all this happen for me. I really, I, I couldn't have done it. You know, I've never worked on a, on an aircraft before. And, and here I am surrounded by all these folks who are more than willing to, to help uh, pitch in and help me get things done. And um, I just, I, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So uh, if I had to pick a shout out, that would be, that would be the one. And then of course, to my wife, Lauren, uh, who has to put up with me being away for almost every Saturday deals with, you know, aircraft parts laying all over the garage and has to listen to me talk about flying constantly. <laughs> yeah. So those are, those would be the shouts out. I think. Right on. All right. So we're getting close to the uh, finish line here, Steve. Um, is there anything I missed or anything else you want to talk about while we got you on the line? Um, yeah. Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I had this great intro into aviation as a kid, but, you know, after I got out of the military, I just stopped flying and um, wasn't until years later that I was able to, to get back into it. And, you know, once I got back into the club and met the folks and saw what it was all about, it, it really started to dawn on me what I had been missing out on, you know, all those years. And honestly, how I had kind of squandered the opportunities that I had as a kid. So I think I'd say that, you know, if you've got the desire to fly, don't waste time, just go for it. You know, soaring provides a very accessible, affordable way of getting into aviation. Even if you've taken a bunch of time off, you know, don't hesitate to jump back on the horse, find a local club, get active, contribute. I promise it'll, it'll pay off. And by the way, I think that if you're fortunate enough to be in this sport, if you're fortunate enough to fly, you know, look for ways to introduce others to it. We've got to grow this sport. Um, take the time to take a kid flying or your friends or whatever. You never know when you might spark that fire in somebody, you know, my favorite thing in flying is to take somebody up for their first time, right? Nothing beats that, that feeling. It's, it's so different than anything they've probably experienced before. It's just, it's amazing. And, and I think really therapeutic and think of it this way. I mean, go back through the years, how many people gave their lives 
trying to do just for a few moments what we can do every day. You know, I, I think that's a gift. And I think we've got a responsibility to pass it along if we can. I think that's what this podcast is is all about. It's about um it's about it's about sharing and trying to grow the sport. It's kind of a labor of love for us. This is why we're doing it. And I think that's 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 really you know, that that's really that's one of the coolest things I've heard anybody say on this podcast ever about especially about remembering, you know, the those people that that you know that gave a lot in those moments and you're you're super spot on with that. Yeah, let's not take it for granted, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I super appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 thanks to you and uh and Chuck for the the great work you guys do on the podcast. It's a really, really good positive thing for the soaring community. So definitely keep it up. Right on. Thanks, Steve. Our longtime sponsor of the show, the Soaring Academy, is engaged in nonprofit outreach work with local area veterans and also with young people for the STEM programs at their top notch glider port facility just outside of Los Angeles, nestled near the north side of the San Gabriel Mountains. They also have a fantastic flight school and are continuing to turn out great glider pilots every month. If you like to donate to their nonprofit initiatives or learn more about their flight school, Go to SoaringAcademy.org or check them out on Instagram at Soaring Academy. Hi, everyone. Sergio from Soaring Master here. Today, we're going to talk about performance improvements available for sailplane pilots nowadays. When we talk about performance improvements or the installation of new devices in any aircraft, we need to be conscious that any design change or performance improvement in any aircraft needs to be in accordance with the sailplane manual and performed under the supervision of a certified mechanic. When we deal with changes in any part of the sailplane, the sailplane manufacturer or an aeronautical engineer needs to be consulted. Changes like the installation of new winglets or wing tip extensions can affect the sailplane's handling, characteristics, and limits. This can affect flight safety, so always consult a professional opinion. With that said, performance improvements in our sailplanes fall in two very different categories. Those which require major changes, like winglets or the installation of tail ballast, or those which don't, like careful fuselage gap sealing, miler installation, installation of brass tail wheels, anything that doesn't require structural reinforcement or changes. Given that sailplane performance when cruising is ruled by the lift to drag ratio, most of improvements which do not require major changes aim to minimize the drag, more precisely parasitic drag, which is generated by air leakage from different parts of the, of the sailplane, mainly canopy, wings, fuselage, surface gaps, and by moving the CG to the aft limit and therefore reducing trim drag. These improvements consist of the easiest ones to be performed during winter maintenance, for instance. Their actual performance increase is hard to estimate, but shall range between 0.1% to 0.2% of drag reduction, depending on the case. Most of the time is making the sailplane deliver the exact drag polar numbers, hardly more than that. But do not be mistaken, this can make the difference between winning a contest or making back home after a long final glide by the end of the day. For greater performance improvements, installing winglets in older sailplane types can be much more effective, mainly when we deal with older sailplane types with trapezoidal wings. The reduction in induced drag in conditions of high wing loading can increase the climb performance in thermals and make the sailplane perform as the original drag puller or slightly better in some cases. Since winglets are fixed devices, they are designed for an optimum range which usually comprises the first third of the speed envelope. Most of winglet's designs will add more profile drag in the high speed part of the drag puller, slightly worsening the sailplane penetration from the middle of the drag puller onwards. Modern winglet designs can perform better in the high speed range, but this effect will be there. 
Improvements in the order of one or two points in maximum L over D are super common with winglets, and this will usually be the main feature advertised by the manufacturer. So if you're willing to install winglets, don't forget to ask the manufacturer or seller about sailplane performance in higher speeds with the pair of winglets installed. The other possibility we have in terms of add-ons is of interchangeable wing tip extensions, usually extending each 6 feet or 2 meters. This will remarkably reduce the sailplane wing loading at maximum takeoff weight, improve the sailplane climb performance, and add some points of maximum L over D as well. The penetration will not be that different from the original sailplane, but each sailplane is a specific case. Interchangeable wing tips can provide the pilot with greater adaptability for different soaring days. They might come with some flight envelope restrictions depending on the sailplane type, and they are usually supplied by the manufacturer. Wing tip extensions for older sailplane types, which haven't been designed for them, need to be designed by an engineer, and in this specific case, the costs might be considerably higher and not all sailplanes will be able to receive this change or this modification without having to be registered as an experimental aircraft. As you can see, there is a good range of options for sailplane improvement out there. Pick up the one with the greatest impact in your objectives and that fits your budget, but don't forget to always consult a mechanic, the sailplane manufacturer or an aeronautical engineer before changing anything in your sailplane. Wish you all great flights. For more tips, follow me on Instagram at SoaringMaster or check my website, SoaringMaster.com. And stay tuned for the next class of the Soaring Master course. See you guys. If you would like to say hi and let us know where you are enjoying the podcast, we would love to hear from you. If you are a glider pilot and want to share your aviation journey, contact us at Chuck at SoaringTheSky.com or send us a message on our website at SoaringTheSky.com and Chuck will get in touch with you. We hope you join us next time for another soaring adventure here on Soaring the Sky, a Glider Pilots podcast. Soaring the Sky is written and produced by Chuck Fulton, co-producer Mitch Thompson. Original music for the podcast was written and produced by Kim Spangler. Graphic design for the podcast was created by Zachary Fulton. Voiceover work was done by Michelle Perez.